West Hill United is a progressive spiritual community where how you live is more important than what you believe. West Hill United is a people, a place, an idea. We are a community living out of a progressive faith, striving to make a positive difference in our own lives, the lives of others, and the world. Join us Sundays at 10.30 a.m. or connect with us at any time. He is from Gabriela Ramos, who was the Assistant Director General for Social and Human Sciences of UNESCO. And she's writing about artificial intelligence. The rapid rise in artificial intelligence, or AI, has created many opportunities globally, from facilitating healthcare diagnoses to enabling human connections through social media and creating labour efficiencies through automated tasks. However, these changes also raise profound ethical concerns. These arise from the potential AI systems have to embed biases, contribute to climate degradation, threaten human rights, and more. Such risks associated with AI have already, have already begun to compound on top of existing inequalities resulting in further harm to already marginalised groups. In no other field is the ethical compass more relevant than in artificial intelligence. These general purpose technologies are, re are reshaping the way we work, interact and live. The world is set to change at a pace not seen since the deployment of the press, printing press six centuries ago. AI technology brings major benefits in many areas, but without the ethical guardrails, it risks reproducing real-world biases and discrimination, fueling divisions and threatening fundamental human rights and freedoms. At the end we, of this, of our readings, we customarily add the phrase, offered us wisdom for the journey. And we invite you now to respond with the phrase, maybe walk in its light. Maybe walk in its light. Now the time we've been waiting for, we get to turn it over to our own John, who will introduce our own Glenn. Over to you, John. Thank you, Babette. It feels very strange to be introducing Glenn because we all think we know him pretty well as our tech guy. But like I'm sure everyone within this community, we all have an existence outside of West Hill and clearly Glenn is no different. So what about Glenn? Well, first of all, I'm not wanting to embarrass him at all, but Glenn has, he, was, he has been by profession, a computer engineer and has spent 30 years in the lab at IBM. I'm sure he must have done more than that. In retirement, he became a consultant, a web page creator, and an adult educator. He has also published several books and magazine articles. His love of the outdoors has led him to join Scouts Canada as a scout leader and then a trainer. And he's also leader for a community walking group and has shared his love of nature and a passion for learning with his family and friends. Glenn is all of these things and more, but he's also integral to how West Hill comes together every Sunday. In addition to all of that, Glenn is a trustee 
and has now serves as chair of the trustees. He's our director of technology, and he's relied on for counsel by many of the teams and staff here at West Hill. So what he has to say to us comes with great wisdom from a long life of experience. So please join me in welcoming our special guest speaker today and our good friend, Glenn Cockwell. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you, John. Um, I've had a lot of fun in life. <laughs> Uh, and I say that with all my heart because fun, uh, all the things I've managed to do is, is, is added up to a, just a wonderful life so far. And I'm looking forward to a lot more ahead. So today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and is it ethical? So that's a very simple statement, but for the next slide we're going to see that there's really two traps in that statement. And what I mean by a trap is you hear the word, but you have no idea what it means. Artificial intelligence is one of them, and most of us have no idea what that means. And the second one is ethics. And yes, I think most people are, feel they're ethical, but what's the definition of ethics? Well, you're going to get my view later on. But anyway, so let's carry on here. Artificial intelligence, and let's start with that one. And there's a, a definition I want you to uh, see it. Next slide. Artificial intelligence is the theory and development of machines. Uh, well, I put in that computers. This wasn't in the original uh, statement. Uh, uh, capable of performing tasks that are historically required human intelligence. Okay, let's start there. Let's start there. Let's start with tasks that require human intelligence. So we'll go to the next slide. And we see a man uh, adjusting a machine. Uh, the advent of the, the steam engines, for instance, uh, required a lot of attention to the uh, adjustment of valves, making sure the pressure didn't get too high, and, and the intelligence of this person was, was key to making sure that this thing didn't blow up. So, artificial intelligence, how did that replace his intelligence? Let's look at the next slide. Yeah, that's it. We taught this thing, it's called a, a pressure relief valve, we taught this thing that if the pressure in the tank got to a certain level, open up the valve. If it gets really high, open up the valve even more. Artificial intelligence? Well, by definition it is, because now we've got a machine doing something that it took intelligence. So we go look in the next slide, and we see a... Um, someone in the accountant department somewhere working on a uh, very complex mechanical machine. He had to know what buttons to push and when to push them and, and all the data that came to this person was on paper. So he'd get big piles of paper and he'd sit there and, and punch the, the uh, buttons on the machine. And um, if you go to the next thing, we discovered that we could put data on paper a little bit differently. We could punch holes in the paper. And, next slide, all the intelligence that was in this guy's head, we transferred into the next slide, which was <laughs> a machine, a 402 calculator poster. And the intelligence that was in his head is now in that wired board. This is where I came in because this is one of the first jobs I had with IBM, wiring those boards. Okay, So they started in 1950 and they were into the, um, they were still around sort of the, into the uh, late 60s, these things. And 
much larger ones. And all the intelligence was captured with all those wires. Let's take another leap forward onto the next slide. And now we have this, this is every day for us, the, the uh, self-checkout machine. The self-checkout machine doesn't have to produce paper to turn into the back office, into holes and cards anymore. It is wired right into the office through a wire. It reads the product. It discovers what product the person is going to buy. It tells the, the uh, head office or back office that this product has just been bought and, by the way, subtract it from inventory. And the other little detail is that it knows who bought it because you've just put your credit card in there and it can go out and find out all the things it needs to know about you. So now it says, oh, these demographic, this is the demographic of the people that buy this product. Wow. This isn't AI. It's certainly driven by very much uh, uh, the attempt to be replacing intelligence of human beings albeit maybe a lot of very menial jobs, but still, it does the job for now. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, and we're going to talk about what AI really is. There's four levels of people have defined AI. And the first level is, is the... The uh, first level of, of AI is, is this reactive machines. No, that was the that was the steam valve, wasn't it? The pressure valve. That was a reactive machine. It is given told that that if you do certain things, this is how we want you to respond. And we can make it smarter and smarter in how it does respond. And and in fact the reactive machine, what's in that list of reactive machines is the AI that is that is in uh, uh, the cars, the automatic, the self-driving cars, that's a reactive AI. It, it has a whole bunch of pra parameters, and if it sees something, uh, a stop sign coming up, it knows to push on the, the brake pedal or cause the brakes to come uh, in uh, contact with the, the big drum of the car, so it is a reactive machine. A whole bunch of those out there. In fact, even in this category is Deep Blue. Remember the, the, the computer program that eventually beat the, the best chess players in the world? That was a simple, very simple AI, a reactive. Someone moves the rook in this direction, and the, the other chess pieces are over here, do this. It, it's been taught how to do it. So, the next level is limited memory. Now this limited memory is, is um, a situation where you, you give the computer a bunch of, of um, information, and it in a way re responds like the reactive memory part, but sometimes it has to extrapolate and go a little bit beyond that, so it does that. The trouble is that sometimes it, going beyond is the wrong thing to do. So the operator starts to say to the computer, that's the wrong response. Now, how? How can the computer understand what a wrong response is? What AI does is it, it weighs information it has. In other words, it says, I know, I know this is connected to this, is connected to this, and kind of is connected to this. That connection is weighted. Simply, I'll say one to ten. It, it, it says it's uh, an eight level connection. The operator comes along and says, okay, and this is the training process. This isn't 
functioning, but this is the training process. The operator says, no, that connection between this and that isn't as important as you've rated it, so now rate that connection a three. We do the same thing. We do the same thing. We, we learn about things and some things we dismiss because we don't feel they're important. We rate them a two or a one. Whereas we, other connections that we see in real life, our relationship with people, whatever, and you can say, oh, this is very important that I pay attention to this. You, we automatically rate it higher. Well, the computer's doing the same thing. It's putting a rating on the connections it's finding. The theory of the mind level is we're not there yet. <laughs> this, is, this is, in a way, a, a level of, of, of computing that, that understands the human thought process that it evaluates things and people uh, based on uh, what it knows about the person or the source or whatever, and it does the evaluation. And we do not, do not have a computer that does this yet. And definitely we don't have the fourth one. And we're going to talk about those last two later on when we get into ethics, and, and you'll understand what I'm trying to say. But we are definitely not at the fourth level yet. That's the thing of sci-fi. And of course, everybody says, oh, you know, once they're self-aware, we're dead. But let's, let's just push that away. That's sci-fi, and, and, and we, it's just people imagining things. So we're going to go on to the next one and say, where is the AI today? What, what status is it in? OK, so we'll go to the next slide. And um, here's a definition for you. A computer system that learns to perform tasks typically requires human... Um, to, uh, AI is, is a computer system that learns to perform tasks typically required by human intelligence. You saw this already. The key word here is learn, learn, learn. How do you learn? Okay, next slide. Well, you just give it a whole bunch of data and tell it what to do with it, right? You, you say, here's the data and, and here's the criteria. Oh, well, it's not really that simple. So let's go on to the next slide. And we're going to look at what the, 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 they classify as data. And I'm not going to go through each one. They're self-explanatory, I think. Uh, you want the AI to know what it's supposed to be doing with the data. You want, to, you want the data to be uh, pertinent to what we're doing. So if you've got an a AI in the medical field, then obviously you're going to give it things about medical field, not about mining. But it, it, there's a massive bunch of things that you have to determine here. One of the things that you might see on there is data privacy, because um, companies that are producing AI need data. The data, the more data that an AI uh, system has to work on, the the more accurate it is, the better it is, the the more they can have that AI system do for the person that's producing it. Let me give you uh, a story. You remember a while back that the city of Toronto was um, contracting with Google to do a smart city down at the docks, that new area down at the docks. They were, trying, they were going to produce a small part of the city that was completely wired. And that wired city that wired city would have cameras everywhere and, and sensors and, and um, microphones, whatever. It was producing a huge amount of data about the flow of people and where they were doing and what they were doing, and that was producing data for Google. 
that was what they wanted. They were very generous in how much they were going to charge to do that, but they were going to have a huge amount of data. So you can imagine that wired city. You walk down the street into that wired city, and you walk into a, um, a drugstore, and you walk out of the drugstore with uh, Tylenol. And the camera picks that up, and you go home and you turn on your computer, and all of a sudden there's an ad for Tylenol. How did they know it was you? Well, face recognition. You've got your face up even on your Facebook page or whatever, and they said, oh, we know that face. That's so-and-so, and they're so old, and they're da 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 They know all about you. That's the fear. That's the fear. What's the good news is that Perhaps they can redesign shopping centers be, to, to be better or more efficient for the shoppers and then get more people into particular stores. Or, or maybe they know how to keep the flow of people moving around city streets a little bit better. But ultimately, that data that Google wanted to, to collect in that wired city was key to all of that. So, on to the next slide. We're going to talk about how the, the learning happens. And the first one, the first one is, is supervised learning. And I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're going to, you want a doc, uh, an AI that, that does some particular function, in other words, um, in the medical field, if, if you want the A to help you in that area, well, you feed it medical data. You feed it data that's on drugs, you feed it, that's labeled drugs. You feed it data on symptoms. You talk, give it data on diseases. You give it data that's categorized and labeled. This is data on this. If you want a, a um, uh, an AI to help you with home decorating, then you're going to give it data relative to home decorating, whether it's color matches, what colors go with which, uh, what combinations have been used. You give it data that is labeled. And you also label the output. So that is supervised learning. You know ahead of time what this data is about and you know ahead of time what it is that you want from the, the AI when you ask it a question. You don't know the specifics, but you know this, where you want it to get that information from. The next one, unsupervised learning, sounds wonderful. Okay, we're not putting labels on things. No one wants to put labels on things, so you don't put labels on things. And there's a massive amount of data that's presented to an AI program in this scenario. How does it do it? How, how can any piece of software, I don't know, care how fast it goes and how much memory it has, how does it deal with this massive amount of data? How it deals with it is it breaks the data into clusters. It just takes a chunk, random chunk. And it goes through that data and it looks for the string. If you don't understand, a string is when you see a whole bunch of what seems to be randomly associated, but all of a sudden you find there's something common in all those things. That's the string. So when you go through uh, uh, the learning process in this unsupervised thing. You give it a, uh, it, it breaks off clusters of data and it looks for a string and if it finds a string, that's more data. It says this cluster of data has this string and goes off to another cluster and does the same thing and off to another cluster and does the whole same thing. And then it looks at strings. Okay, what common strings do we have? Do I have a whole bunch of clusters that have the same string? Oh, well, maybe we should put them together and see if there's anything common in there beyond the string that we saw. 
And it goes on and on and on, and it keeps on diving deeper and deeper and deeper into the data. So unsupervised learning is, is where we're at now in, in a lot of the massive systems where they, they try to put as much data in and find as many commonalities between the various elements as they can. The last one, number three, is kind of a combination of the first two, but it, it's, it's kind of like I mentioned about uh, the self-driving cars. When AI comes up with a connection between these things, then the, uh, the person that's, now this is before it hits public, by the way, this is in the training process. The, they start discovering whether the connections between that the AI is finding is good or bad, and they start rating these connections. That's the supervision, uh, the, 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 the reinforcing and the, what they call the deep learning. So now it's getting a little bit smarter because it starts to realize that certain strings that it thought it saw are not valid. It starts to see where some, some relationships are really more important than others. And they're being told by human beings what that rating is. They're starting to get a better feel for being better as opposed to just being right, okay? So the next slide is a picture of an AI. And it makes a whole bunch of sense, right? Right. Okay, you can see it. One of the things I haven't talked about, of course, is the, 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 the speech, the, the way they communicate. All good AIs have a, a, a way of, of talking in natural language instead of the cryptic thing you have to use on a Google search. And you can see it has a whole bunch of things, supervised, unsupervised, deep learning over there. Uh, we can plug in the visuals and data can be visual data as well as uh, physical data and so on. So if this is confusing, let's try the next slide. Same thing. That makes it all clear, right? Oh yeah, I, I could tell Scott right away, could just, uh, 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 that worked. Now let's go on to the third slide. These, this is for people that like Venn diagrams says the same thing, exactly the same thing. But I want you to pay attention to the, the deep learning spot right in the middle, because we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that. Because very specific, deliberately, the person that drew this diagram said, deep learning is important. It's got to be the key. So keep this, uh, I'll show this again when I want to talk about it, but this is key to where we're going to go next. So let's go to the next slide. So where does ethics fit in? Where does ethics come in? That's a good question. So let's go on to the next slide. I'm going to tell you a bit of a story, just to illustrate. It's sort of a way. Uh, ethics. The next slide shows a computer that I installed back in probably 1970. 1970. This, this was a process control computer, massive thing. It, it, um, it, by the way, the same computer controlled the, uh, the, the um, nuclear reactor, Pickering uh, nuclear reactors. So it's, it, it was process control, but in this particular instance, instance, instance uh, the um, process wasn't there yet. They were still building it. So uh, there was, because it didn't have anything to control, the programmers that they hired uh, had time on their hands. So they built an AI program. Now remember what I said, an AI program gathers, you feed it a whole bunch of data, and then it goes out and finds connections, and it finds relationships between the data, and it comes up with conclusions based on that. 
So, what data were they feeding into it? Well, we'll see on the next slide. Yeah, you got it. The results of horse races. Because their concept is if they knew what a horse did and how fast it ran, and when it ran against other horses in, a, in today's race, not the one where the data they were feeding it in, they could predict what horse was going to win or at least come second or third, win place or show. So they had this, had this computer process all the races they could get their hands on where the various horses raced in and who they raced against and when they raced and what the track was like and whether it was hot or cold and they processed all that and remember the previous slide their input was all on slide on uh, those paper cards that's that was the input was the card deck and they took their results, they printed out, and the printed out it was, it was a stack of paper about six inches thick. And they went out to the, to the racetrack, and they did two dry runs. And they did these runs, and they said, wow, we can make a lot of money, because the AI predicted two or three of the races pretty closely. So then they decided that this was going to go live. So they ran the program against the, the card that came up for that Saturday. They got a bunch of money out of the bank and headed out to the track. And they sat there. And by the way, part of what was in here was the odds. The odds, the odds, odds reflect what the, the other experts sitting in the stands think about these horses, right? You know, the more people bid on a particular horse, the odds go down. <laughs> if just a few people bet on a horse, the odds are much higher. So, uh, they, they got down and they, and they waited until the horses were just going to go off. Just before the, the, the betting closed down for a race, they checked their, their chart if they saw a horse that was being predicted to be in, in the uh, win place show and the odds were right, you know, 10 to 1, whatever, whatever, they went in and they dumped down their 200 or $300 on that horse because even if they won one at 10 to 1, they, they could play all day at that point, right? Because it's 10 cards or races on the card. They lost it all. Lost it all. And you know why? The AI wasn't wrong. But when they wanted up to, went up to the, the window and put their bet of whatever they were betting on, $300, they changed the odds. They took the odds that were sitting at 10 to 1, brought it down to 2 to 1, and, and if you lose a race after that, you've lost everything. So they, what they didn't realize is they were messing with the data. Anyways, that's my story. Ethics. Ethics says here that they tried to make the system with the computer and it didn't work. And they got stung and they got taught a very good lesson. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. So, what is ethics? Ethics is a branch of philosophy that is concerned with the conduct and more specifically the behavior of individuals in society. Oh, yeah, okay. Let's try the next slide. Here's what Isaac Asinoff thought about AI. Now, this is back in 1942. This is uh, when I was born. And he predicted that we would have the level four AI. In other words, self-aware um, machines. And he put out these three laws of robotics. A robot, first law was a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to be uh, to, uh, to, harm, uh, to be harmed, I think I mistyped that. 
The reason I put yellow on there is, again, there's two words here, injured and harm. Require definitions, don't they? What is injury? What is harm? It isn't, you know, you first think, well, break arm or, or kill them or something like that, or uh, harm is, is, is uh, wounded or something like that. But there's the, but we're human beings. We're not just machines. And a lot of harm happens in our brain. And a lot of injury happens in our brain. And Isaac Asanoff knew that because he then made a whole bunch of money writing more books, twisting those words. Okay, so it was, they were fun to read at the time. All these whodunits where the robots are the uh, protagonists and he, had, he found a way to twist these words, harm and injury. So, as much as it sounded good, it really wasn't the best. Second law, robot must obey the orders given to the human being except where such orders will conflict with the first law. Now, we've already said that there's harm and injury beyond, beyond just physical harm and, and injury. Now, this second law is saying it must be ethical, isn't it? saying that the robot must be ethical. It can't allow harm and injury to happen to a human being. And in a way, that's ethics in my mind. And then the third law, of course, assumes the fourth level of, of robotics, which is self-awareness. And, you know, we're not there yet. <laughs> but his, his robots were so they, he had the third law where they couldn't, um, uh, they had to protect themselves. And you don't protect yourself, you don't know you exist. So self-awareness is, is uh, necessary for that third law. So let's go on to the next one. Next slide. And now we're seeing there's a, a list of, of, of how data should be fed that is ethical. Uh, take bias and fairness. Uh, you can read those. Uh, transparency, privacy, accountability, responsibility, security. Security is the interesting one, isn't it? Where did the data come from? We keep on hearing stories of, of companies being hacked, that their database has been stolen. Is that the database you're going to throw into your AI? I hope not. I hope not. But there's a bunch of things that, that basically you feel good. If, if this was true, if this is how they put data in, then you could feel a little bit better about it. But we do not control the data going in. We don't know whether it came from a private database. We don't know um, who provided the data. We don't know. They know, but we don't know where the data came from. So let's go on to the next one. Next slide. Does AI know it's being ethical? And next slide. There's that deep learning thing. This is where it's all going to happen, down and down in the depth, where the, we hope there's an ethical filter on anything that the AI is doing. But ethics is a funny word. Next slide. Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have the right to do and what is the right thing to do. So ethics isn't the black and white of is it right or wrong? Is there a law against it or is there a rule against it? Ethics 
goes beyond that and says, yeah, you can, you can do, you can figure out the black and white of this, but now is it the right time to do it? Let's go to the next slide. Ha. This is very deliberately blank. <laughs> This is, this is sort of a disclaimer here. I'm about to talk about ethics, and I'm an 81-year-old geek. I have not taken philosophy courses. I have not taken ethics courses. But I feel, personally, in my heart, that I'm ethical. Am I always ethical? Uh, well, that's a different discussion at all. But I think I understand what being ethical is. So this is, this is Ethics 101, according to Glenn. Ethics, to me, is a big dose of... <sighs> big dose of, of, of feeling that things are right. Empathy. It's a huge dose of empathy because in many cases you get into a situation where you know this is the, the black and white, this is the right thing to say or this is the wrong thing to say, but you also know by looking at your audience, looking at their eyes, look at their mood, their, the timing is wrong and you apply your ethics and there's more to it. The other part that um, I put into ethics is remorse. What do I mean by that? Well, it means that when I mess up, I know it. And I don't like the feeling of how I feel when I have messed up. That's remorse. The, the, when you understand that, that what you've done is not the right thing to do. And when I apply, remorse can do a lot of things for people. Some people can be very uh, debilitating. Um, other people, it's just a kick in the behind that says, be smarter next time. But it is part of your memory of how things went down. It, guide you in the future. So, as I say, this is ethics, according to Glenn, is, is being ethical, uh, being, being uh, um, um, having empathy for what it is, the situation you're in, and comparing it to the past, and has this been wrong in the past, the remorse. Having said that, let's go on and be a little bit happier about AI. Because AI, I'm hoping you're understanding at this point in time, AI as it exists today is just a very, very fancy search engine. If you've ever done research on Google, you'll know that you have to be very, very careful in how you ask Google to go look for things. You have to use the right words, the right sequence. Whereas AI, AI, a good AI, has a natural language interface. So it will infer by you simply saying, you know, uh, tell me about blue cars. Um, it, will, it will infer that you're you're looking at, at uh, vehicles that, uh, yes, have blue paint, but you, you want to go out and, and see what is offered, what makes are being offered with, with uh, blue paint on them, that type of thing. So AI will infer from your natural language, you're just speaking to it, what it is you want. Is there ethics? Well. AI, tell me a recipe for chocolate cake. Okay, and you know what's going to happen. It's going to go out and look at all the recipes for chocolate cake and see the ratings. 
that, that um, are put on them. And perhaps it's from a website that has uh, rate this recipe uh, and, and it says, it reads the, the extensions and people say this was this is a five, uh, five, I rate this a five, but in fact uh, it is a little bit difficult to do because of yada yada, the ingredient and so on and on and on. So AI, AI can infer from your natural language what it is you want that, that beyond what Google can do for you. But AI has a lot of things. I, I go to my little list here. Uh, that's not the one I wanted. Okay, so we know about AI and self-driving cars. Uh, how many people have one of the uh, little prompts in their house, the Alexa or Google Assist or, or Siri, you know, that that's all driven by AI. So, and it's good. I mean, it really is. You know, you're sitting there, you got your hands full, and you don't want to push a button because it'll make a mess on the stove button. And you say, you know, for us, it's Google. Google set a time for 10 minutes. It's done. And I don't have to wash my hand off to push the button on the timer. Um, you can you can set these things up. Google remind me in uh, at uh, 10 o'clock tonight to go to bed. You know, it'll start waking you up after you're napping in that easy chair to go to bed. You know. All those wonderful things that AI can do, they also are employed in the helplines. Helplines are are you, if you go on the phone today and dial a helpline, you know you're not talking to a person. That you're, you're just, the, there's no one on the other end of that line. So um, that's AI. You're talking to the AI. Um, in businesses, it's just hugely helpful in market an analysis. We talked about the point of sale, um, uh, where you scan it yourself. It knows all about the people that buy your product, why they bought it, when they bought it, how old they are and to a certain extent by looking at your credit rating, um, whether you can really afford it or not. Are people buying things because they, they need them or because they, they uh, just feel that it's important to have? And Mike, you know about healthcare, I'm sure the AI that's out there I mean, I always admire doctors. They have to remember so much. <laughs> There's all the, all the information that comes in constantly. Well, hopefully this will help in the process. So anyways, AI is out there. It can be used. It can be used unethically. Um, Aaron and I were just talking about uh, the uh, use of AI to produce essays in school. Okay. Um, it's an interesting concept because everybody's up in arms. Oh my God, you know, they, they can do, uh, uh, they don't have to read the book, they can do an essay on the book, or they can uh, give me a, an opinion about such and such a, a, a character in such and such a novel. And you think this is new, don't you? You think this is new. It isn't new, folks. Next slide, please. <laughs> Anybody that was to school between 1950 and two, year 2000 knows about these things. And for the people online that, that didn't grow up in Toronto, Cole's notes were cheat sheets. They were produced by actually a, a bookstore called Cole's Bookstore. And there was a, the guy that running it was an English major and he wrote all these books and what they basically were a 10 page uh, a pamphlet that told you what the book was about, why it was about, and, and had answers to any possible question that the English teacher could ask about that book. 
And I know people that got 80s and 90s on their English exams and never cracked the book that they were answering the questions on, just got the Coles notes. So, was this ethical? Mm. Oh, by the way, and I have it up there, the US, the, the, the same things were put out under the title of Cliff's Notes. Did you, you know them, you know. Ellen just said she knows them. <laughs> you didn't use them though, did you? No, no. <laughs> so, this has been around forever. Ethical use of AI. Um, we've heard stories about uh, paintings that have been forged by simply saying to AI, paint this or do this drawing in the style of so-and-so, and then it's put out there. This is not the AI being unethical. It's the user of the AI being unethical. So next slide. This is a quote that I got recently. If we are taught how to read and write in school, shouldn't we also be taught how to use AI to our advantage? Samuel Tayabji. I know my Sammy. He's my 14-year-old grandson. And you say, oh, isn't that nice? Next slide, please. This was in two days later. This was in the Toronto Star adding to the technical toolkit at private schools. Next slide, because you can't read that little stuff part. There it says, using artificial intelligence also means ensuring students understand its, an, its ethical implications. That's where we're at. So next slide. We started, we started this discussion with the question, is AI ethical? And I'm going to submit to you that's the same question, or the same ilk of a question as what type of gasoline does your EV use? Okay. They are non sequiturs. AI and ethics are not the same. AI can be used ethically, it can be used unethically, but AI itself cannot be ethical because it cannot have the emotions that we attach to ethics. So, as this quote says, don't be afraid of AI because most of the fear you have is misinterpretation of the significance of AI, what it can do for us. It's a very, very powerful uh, tool, but it is not going to make a difference in society that's unethical unless someone uses it unethically. And so, next slide. Thank you. Any questions? Questions, sure. Questions. Become a sustaining champion of West Hill United's work by committing to an automatic monthly donation. Learn more or donate now through Canada Helps.